Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is poet and songwriter Reuben Lee Dalton. Reuben, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here, David. Yeah, you've, you've been on the show a couple times playing music, but this time I, I wanted to hear your poetry. We're going to end with a song, so um, your many fans will be not disappointed about that. But um, we're going to start off with, with some poetry, and this is from your book, Broken Bottles, right? Yes, yeah. Now, this is a book that um, you worked on for a long time, but then it came out right around the time of the pandemic. It was right in the middle of the pandemic, yeah. so it's been sort of sitting, waiting in the closet right. to get out. So right. here so, we are. It's so great. it's kind of making its debut here on yeah, TBSB. Yeah. yeah, this is great. Yeah, well, tell us about the first poem you're going to read. So, uh, you know, over the years I've written a lot about father-son relationships, family. Also, we'll read later some of the combat war poems I've written, but this first one is about my father, who is a, a carpenter, and uh, taught me a lot of value about work, and uh, this incident was kind of interesting after he had had a little accident at work. Okay. It's called Only His Poem. He worked alone that ordinary morning, full of balsam sweetness that comes from cutting green Douglas fir and long shadows reclining on sawdust between slow motion of motes floating in early sunlight. Small rippings have always led carpenters down harm's way. They pin the guard up to work closer with the blade, to cut narrow furring strips that plumb the doors and level the windows. He worked alone that day. Another set of hands would have guided the board beneath the blade. Another set of eyes would have seen the knot before the two by four bucked and dragged his finger through the whirring steel. There was no one to help him find the severed finger, to lay it on ice in his lunchbox. He drove himself to the emergency, his hand wrapped in his t-shirt, held to the headliner. Evening he returned with a glove of snow-white gauze, crimson about the tips of his remaining fingers, pale as he walked to the kitchen, dreading telling his wife. That hot August night, he sat alone in pain. 3 a.m. on my run for water, I see him sitting on the couch in the living room, his cloud-like hand cradled in a sling. He was writing poetry, told me it takes his mind off the pain. Can I see it? He carefully shifted the strips of gauze, shifted the jagged, stitched stub, a strange bloom of swollen and red purple. He did this for me, though I could tell it hurt him. And he did not understand what I was really after. He died last year, and I have continued to wonder more and more about that poem, about those words that take your mind off the pain. Wow, that's a really powerful poem. Um, it, it's a, obviously you know, a deeply powerful poem about the father-son relationship. It also is really um, intimate with the details of work, <laughs> yeah. of making things, of yes. carpentry. Yes. And I know you spent a good bit of your life as a contractor. Um, oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious about that. It, you know, it, it seems like poets are really keen to get the things of this world, you know, the objects, the images. Has working in contracting, has that helped your poetry? Well, absolutely. You know, once I wanted to become a poet, I saw the value in, in writing poetry. All those details. Mm -hmm. Fill the pages. Right. I think they, yeah. they they can tell the story. Yeah. So yeah, it's valuable. It's great to be able to name specific tools and to know what they do. Yeah. And the, yeah. the problems that are encountered. It's true. 
And, and so was she the person who inspired you to write poetry, or is that just a kind of... No, that was sort of an aside. That was before I decided I really did want to write, right. but I was always curious about writing, and right. I, I, you know, I fell in love with certain authors and books when I was a boy. Right. And so uh, when he was up in the middle of the night writing by himself, it was a new thing I saw him doing, mm. so I was, I was intrigued. You were taken by that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, you are a grandpa. Um, yeah. In addition to being a, a father, and and so um, I, I think that's really important to you. You know, a kind of um, bringing like a, a male perspective from father to son on down. Yes. And, yeah. um, I'd love to hear the next poem, which I believe is about your son. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when my son was, I think he was six, uh, we we had planned on doing an excursion to see Haley's Comet, mm -hmm. and so this is a poem about that particular okay. evening, and. Uh, it's called Haley's Comet, 1986. Wow. In the muted glow of dashboard lights, I see untied shoelaces dangling over the front seat edge. Your eyes still sleep caked after waking you at 3 a.m., carrying you to the car in clothes you went to sleep in. We have planned this trip twice aborted by flu and fog but tonight, we climb. And I see you take a startled breath as we plow through the first cloud. Are we flying, Daddy? You ask, half asleep. Let's pretend, I tell you. And we fly and weave our way up Sulphur Mountain until we are above the clouds and the sky springs at us like a huge, playful panther. At the ridge, we pull over onto gravel. Choose the place where we will stand and scan the universe for our comet. You find it on the horizon, a smeared thumbprint of light. Disappointing, but then talk about how we are here together in the center of this event sky, on this ridge, beneath this mystery. You ask how long before the comet returns. Seventy-six years, I tell you. How old will I be, Daddy, when we see it again? Eighty-two years old, my son. How old will you be, Daddy? And as I hesitate, I see a worried look cross your face like a shadow. I look to the sky for resolution, for what will be left of our love 76 years from now, and what of all the loving sons and fathers before us, Unknown, forgotten, gone with too few words. Should I pretend to have an answer? Like a lost manner, I search the stars for bearing and point out to you from very unsteady footing that many of these stars and suns burned out long ago, yet still hug and kiss us every night. With squinted eyes, you look back to the stars and then back to me and with great confidence tell me, stars never die, Daddy, and I am so relieved you are clearer on this subject than I. We stand hand in hand, a father and a son, on a ridge top, a silhouette of a man and a boy, marveling at Orion and Mars, Venus and the Dippers, and this comet, ill-defined as life itself. That's great. And I, I love how you take a, a situation that every parent has faced, you know, the awkward question, in this case, the awkward question, are you going to be alive in 76 yeah, years? Yeah, the answer is, yeah he sure. caught me off guard, I got to say, on that yeah, one. Yeah, but, but you, you turned it into something more universal, too, you yeah. know, just about how, how we relate to each other. Yeah. And, um, uh, and also, you know, the stars go on, well, not forever, but they seem like forever yeah, to us. Yeah. And, and I think that speaks to the, the kind of the next area you're going to talk about, which is your interaction with the natural world. Yeah, yeah. Um, why is that important to you? Well, um, it's, it's to go into nature is freeing from all the, the roaring noise that we have in our day-to-day -day life, the distractions, the things that, that knock us out of the realm where we shouldn't be taking them for granted. Right. And to go to nature and, and to just see the immensity of what it offers you in terms of mountains, rocks, water, it's just always been very humbling and spiritual for me. Mm -hmm. So it's, 
something I've written about quite a bit. Yeah, well, let's hear, let's hear one of those poems. I've got this cast on the hand, which makes the page turn. Yeah, we, the, the, and this cast on the hand is going to play a, a role in our, our, our musical performance yeah, at right. the end of the show because you are unable to play guitar right now. Next to the river, the Adirondacks in 1977. Cure pine makes good kindling and balsam incense and the needles an aromatic mattress that carry the sleeping up to the alpine stars. We camp next to the river, where it spills over stones that shine like bones and moss carpets the fir trees. The fire cracks in the brisk morning silence, heats the dented pot brewing cowboy coffee, and my aging hands as they wash one another inches above the flames. Good morning, I say, for all this simplicity. I walk with my rod to the edge of the pond to catch the rainbow, German brown, or cutthroat, hoping to hook one no bigger than the frying pan handed down from my father. Although the air is so sweet, eating seems more a ritual than a necessity. There is a fawn just across the creek, dappled and glistening with white amniotic fluid, unsteady, wobbly, its mother watching in the sword ferns just a few feet away. Trust me, I whisper, carefully banking, backing, stepping to my fire. Mm, that's a nice one. And again, you know, the poet's skills of observation are bringing to life the situation that yeah, a lot of people you. have encountered yeah, going, yeah, going, going, going camping. Um, I, I'd love to hear another poem. Sure. About the this one's called Crow. I had a therapist who loved crows, and I loved him, so I, <laughs> I wrote this for him. Ron Blanchett, Crow. Some say your color only takes, gives back nothing. Yet the spectrum dances within your black folds. You are defiant only to those who won't look or listen. I have heard you fill the air with gripe, but mostly I watch you listening eyes like ember burning and filmed with old sorrow. How have you come to temper your fear, to speak your mind with no reservation? I envy your patience, your stillness on that crooked fence post, your newest plumage bending in the breeze. Oh, that's nice. I want to I wanna do our kind of Final segment on um, some poems about the Vietnam War. Sure. So, tell us a little bit about your your experience and participation. In yeah, when I was uh, high school, I um, had an apartment with some fellows that were a little bit older than I am, or was. Three of us, four of us, actually joined the Marine Corps as a buddy system because we thought there was going to be some sort of benefits to where we went and how we would be together. Right. So we enlisted, and uh, we all went to Vietnam almost immediately. Right. And as of this time, all three of the others have passed away, some from Agent Orange, some were killed in combat, some had heart disease from right. all related to drinking the water over there. Uh -huh. So I have a lot of respect and love for veterans. Right. And, uh, and we're going to hear that in the song that you sing at, yeah, at the yeah. end of the show. Yeah. But it's it's a it's a complicated one. I mean, you're obviously as a as a combat veteran, you ha you've seen, as you say in the song, men at their worst and their best. Um, but I don't think of you as just being a a pure rah rah patriot who is always in support of every conflict that the U.S. can can go into. No, it was very interesting getting over there in the evenings after we'd be on patrol or whatever. We would have very heartfelt discussions, and there was always two sides to the issue. Right. But some of us were reading Look Magazine and Time Magazine, seeing the, fig uh, the pictures, seeing the, the uh, unrest at home regarding the uh -huh. war. And others were just hardcore patriots, and they thought this is what we should be doing. they should be doing. Yeah. When, when you got back to the States, that was quite the... <laughs> awakening, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've told you a little bit. I had a homecoming of getting off the plane after a 13-hour flight and, and kissing the tarmac, being right. home, and, and hearing thuds around me. And um, uh, MP came, grabbed my collar, and said, we got to go. And I looked up, and there were about 50 demonstrators over there 
throwing fruit at us. That was our welcome home. So right. I realized, okay, this is probably going to be a little worse than I anticipated. Right, it's going to be complicated. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's hear um, the poem. I think Good Friday. Okay. Yeah. We went out on an operation, and it was uh, I think it was Easter time, and uh, we uh, we were in this field, very hot, where the air is just vibrating the, uh, the earth and the, the moving air is up and, and we weren't really sure what we were seeing. And um, we knew that the NBA were in this particular valley. Mm -hmm. So we were just waiting. And then sure enough, they showed up across the river and that's what this, the poem kind of explains okay. the rest of it. If I can just get to it real quick here. Good Friday. At one time, Good Friday meant the coming of the weekend, as did all those Fridays during Lent, those premature spring afternoons during the Stations of the Cross, when I held my breath in laughter after Jimmy Mallard farted, so as not to get drug out of the pew by Mother Amadeus pinching my ear, while Father O'Connor waved the incense about the sanctuary that became the scent of spring heralding the coming of summer, the release from the stifling tomb of the sixth grade. At one time, Good Friday became a dried rice paddy where the air rose in vibration with heat and moisture and fear and those 60 men across the river moving over the field so weighted down with mortars and rockets and weapons, we first thought they were water buffalo. Now caught in our sights, with no cover, as we fired round after round and watched them struggle through their last moments. At one time, Good Friday will become a day of atonement, a day that mystical Jew was crucified supposedly for all our sins, a day where I will sit somewhere on a patio once again in the premature summer heat, telling stories to my grandchildren, and when they ask me about the war, I will not draw details in black and white or paint the colors of mutilation. I will not try to describe the smell of death, but I will speak in my kindest voice about how cruel we can be to one another and about how very sad war is. Mm, that's great. It sounds like exactly what you would be saying to a child, and it sums that up so nicely. Yeah. Well, the the last poem you have is is about music and 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 its involvement in, in dealing with this trauma. Um, so this is a poem called Resolve. It's I called think. Resolve, and uh, this poem came out of my connection with music in Vietnam. Um, when we would get back from our patrols, there was always a group of a mix of guys, southerners, cold miners, and they would be playing well after into the night. The generators would go out. And I just loved to sit there and listen to them. And it's at that point that I learned my first three chords and okay. decided I wanted to do music. This is called Resolve. Quail scurry across the path this morning as I walk to the barn. The sentinel standing vigilant on the fence post, wary of my ever step sending out his warning song. So many birds stirring in the dry grass, chirping and whistling as they forage. In the barn, still warm from yesterday's sun, my 12-string waits. And a romance that came about the war, one of the rare, beautiful things about that 14 months, and those country boys who found love every night after patrolling the rice paddies and the elephant grass valleys, who played the guitars and mandolins and sang with a harmony too rare in this sad country. There was the evening after they lost their point man they played late into the night, long after the generators were turned off. Songs about going home, mothers and fathers, and how their voices became a chord like no instrument could ever play. It was the night I became entranced with the power of music, about love and longing, pain and suffering, the blood beneath the lyrics. Whenever this guitar sits with me, even with these inept fingers, 
a miracle takes place as I begin to strum. A resolve that connects with cowboys, natives chanting, cavemen and women beating, homeless, and soldiers singing about their lost brothers. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna we're gonna hear more about that yeah. in just a moment in, in your song. I'm, I'm interested. I mean, you kind of grew up as a Southern California oh, yeah. surfer kid, yeah. um, and and yet uh, I think when people listen to the body of your music, either as Reuben Lee Dalton or the Reuben Lee Dalton Band, or even the Winehounds, um, yeah. we hear a kind of Americana. Like you've, you, you've you've obviously stretched your your thinking much beyond that. One of my favorite songs by yours is called Montana. Uh -huh. um, tell me a little bit about that uh, reaching out from where you started to to this larger picture of the country. Uh, you know, when I uh, came home, I I wanted to be a musician. I toured a little bit in Europe. I had the opportunity to go to a really nice university, so I came home from Europe. Long story short, met my wife in college, had children, set my guitar away. Mm. But I found I could write poetry and still be a father. But I didn't see myself being a musician and a good father. A and traveling musician. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, I have to say, I think that learning about poetry and about metaphor and image was very helpful for in songwriting. It is a different animal than poetry in some respects. Mm -hmm. But a good image is a good image, and, and that's what you want is that connection. That's what we're looking for with the image. So it worked into when my kids grew up and I took the guitar out of the closet, it, it all sort of fell into place mm -hmm. for me, and I started writing lyrics. And lyrics are much tighter than poetry. Yeah, You have to be more concise and more economic. But yeah. uh, well, I'd like to sit on that for just a little bit longer because that, that's fascinating to me as someone who's also a poet and a, yeah. a much lesser of a songwriter. But um, there is so much difference, and, and, and I, I feel like you, you nailed it with the imagery is so strong, and the imagery is, is so strong really mm -hmm. in, your, um, uh, in your, your poems and your, your, your songs. But do you feel like... You can only do a certain type of thing in, in one area that you can't do in another, you know? I mean, is there a certain emotion or thought process or, uh, you know, what, what does poetry do better than, than songwriting? Well, what I would tell a songwriter if he wants to become a good lyricist is to read poetry. Mm -hmm. Learn about images, learn about that, and, uh, uh, and that'll build your lyrics up a lot. Right. As far as the reverse goes, yeah, it works both ways. It's all about... Um, especially if you write to connect. You know, so there's a lot of different reasons to write. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a very personal, private thing and it's not shared. Other times it's a need for people to connect. It's right. a great way to, to, to bond with an audience or a person. Right. So there's different reasons and they work together. But, right. you know, they're different, it, they're different disciplines, right. but there's some overlap that right. can really be helpful to both. That makes sense, yeah. I mean, I know that you, um, we just have about a minute left, but um, in both your songwriting and your poetry, despite the horrors that you've seen, you have a, basically an optimistic temper. Um, you know, I, I end up feeling there's hope at the end of the, the tunnel for... That's great. Yeah, I'm glad I'm... Is that is that I, something that you're conscious of? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean... Um, I write a lot of ballads and there are a lot of stories, um, um, sort of borderline almost country, but I, I would call myself more of a folk uh, Americana uh -huh. artist. So um, yeah, I think, I think I do like to end on a positive note. Not all the time, but uh, a good majority of the time. Cool. I like to leave people feeling well. And I hope they're going to feel that that way is when we go to our song here. So before we do, I want to um, say that the Creative Community is a co-production of TVSB in Santa Barbara and Caps Media in Ventura. Um, and now um, we're going to move the set around a little bit. We're going to bring in our friend Pierre Amble on the ukulele. Yeah, Pierre. And um, let's see what we can do. Great, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Lord, they're in your hands You know what they've given 
what they left behind. I hope they find in heaven. So take them in. They've seen men at their worst and their best. They held up under fire. And now it's time for them to rest. Open up those gates. Let my soldiers through. No need to check them in. They've done everything a soldier could do. Don't need no marching band. Don't need no rambling speech. No medals to pay. Just open up those gates. So heaven take them in. These young soldiers who fell. Give them a bar full of their brothers. Let them raise a little hell And give them a road on a desert Where they can drive real fast Laughing, yell like crazy kids Tell the law to kiss their ass Open up those gates Let my soldiers through No need to check them in They've done everything a soldier could do don't need no rambling speech. Don't need no marching band. No medals to pay. Just open up those gates. And maybe the Lord will help them find the love they never knew. Girls will kiss them deep and dance the whole night through. Open up those gates, let my soldiers through. No need to check them, they've done everything a soldier could do. Don't need no marching band, don't need no rambling speech. No medals to pay, just open up those gates. Let my soldiers